in one. Oh, and I have uh, managed to change our presentation. So I'm going to reopen our presentation. Apologies. I always manage to do at least at least one technical error <laughs> in each session. So that's our technical error for this session taken care of. So welcome to our Nuclear Waste Online 2014, our February series. This is Brene Lloyd from Northwatch, and we're welcoming Dr. Gordon Edwards for this, after, for this afternoon session, uh, which is on reprocessing, recycling, and the nuclear renaissance. So we're going to begin with just some background and context uh, uh, material before we get into Dr. Edwards' presentation. And the context for these, this webinar series is the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's proposal uh, adaptive phase management, which has as its endpoint uh, the intended burial, deep burial, of all of Canada's nuclear fuel waste in a community which they are now seeking to identify through a, a nine-step site selection process. And we do have, to date, 50,000 tons, about 3 million bundles of nuclear fuel waste generated by on, uh, Ontario Power Generation, Hydro-Quebec, and New Brunswick Power in storage uh, in various states at the reactor station. Since 1977, the industry has been de developing plans uh, under various uh, entities to bury high-level radioactive waste, to bury the waste that they have created. And we've seen a, a variety of uh, processes and uh, exercises, the most recent of which is the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's Adaptive Phase Management, released in 2005 and uh, given the green light uh, for next steps by the federal government in 2007. So the Nuclear Waste Management Organization's proposal is, at essence, the burial of high-level nuclear fuel waste deep below the surface in either uh, a crystalline rock, granite formation, or sedimentary rocks. And they have identified uh, 21 communities have identified a willingness to be studied. That list has now been reduced to 16 communities. Uh, remaining communities are one in northern Saskatchewan, 10 in northern Ontario, and four in southwestern Ontario. And these communities are being studied through a nine-step process. And most of the communities uh, who are still in the process at this point are in step three. One remains in step two. At step eight, fairly far along the siting process, uh, construction and operation of an underground demonstration facility begins and transfer to shallow caverns could begin. This is a, a, a step in the NWMO process or an option in the NWMO process that uh, doesn't always get a lot of attention, but it is a, a, a potentially a companion piece to any future reprocessing of nuclear fuel waste in Canada. So the Nuclear Waste Management Organization has done a, a number of different backgrounders, papers, commissioned and in-house related to uh, reprocessing of used nuclear fuel, of high-level nuclear waste. They issued a backgrounder in 2010 that made a, a couple of statements um, that reprocessing of CANDU fuel would produce residual radioactive waste that would be more difficult to manage than use fuel in its unprocessed form. And uh, they recognized the connection to the production of nuclear weapons in a reprocessing um, uh, circumstance. Uh, in that same background, uh, they also identified the intent to uh, retain the possibility to retrieve used fuel, fuel if needed. Uh, whether that need would be because of poor performance of the uh, of the containers and so contingency response, or whether that uh, state so-called need would be for the reprocessing of the fuel is not uh, certainly not made clear in the backgrounder. Other papers commissioned by the nuclear waste management organization. Nuclear Waste Management Organization give some different messages. For example, 
an NWMO discussion paper from 2008 focuses on uranium price as the determinant in uh, whether reprocessing would be a uh, an option to be pursu pursued and states that there is a significant chance that the break-even price of uranium, breaking even with the price of reprocessing, could be reached before the end of the uh, NWMO project, so before repository closure. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization keeps a watching brief on the development of these and other nuclear fuel management technologies, and those are all posted on the Nuclear Waste Management Organization website, as are the previous papers just cited. So that is the context for today's discussion uh, with respect to the NWMO citing exercises, citing efforts. And I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Gordon Edwards for the main presentation today. Dr. Edwards is the president of the Canadian, Can Canadian uh, Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility and is a, an acknowledged expert in Canada on uh, nuclear matters, both uh, various applications of nuclear technology and nuclear waste. So, Dr. Edwards. Thank you very much, Bernain. Welcome, everybody. Um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, say that I don't really believe that any of us are actually experts in, t in coming to grips with nuclear waste. It, to me, it's a, it's a major unsolved problem of the human race, and it hasn't been acknowledged as such. We have a bluff going on where the nuclear industry is pretending that they have a solution, um, which is not based on any kind of scientific assurance, because even the mathematical models cannot be validated over these enormously long periods of time. So we're really talking about a scientific Hail Mary. And what we're talking about is uh, it would be more appropriate to use the word that Ontario Power Generation is using in another context, and that is it's abandonment. What they want to do is they want to abandon this waste. They want to wash their hands of it. It doesn't mean that we really get rid of it. It's, it's going to be there, and it's going to be in the environment, and nature is a great recycler. So that's really uh, uh, our perspective from the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. Now, the question is, uh, the industry has always, from the very beginning, been committed to the idea of closing the nuclear fuel cycle. And even the use of the word nuclear fuel cycle implies that they're going to be recycling something. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the actual flow chart here, you see that it's really just a chain. It just goes uh, from the mine to the mill to the refinery to the reactor, and then finally to some kind of questionable burial. But to close the cycle, you have to either en enrich the uranium and then reprocess the spent fuel um, so that you can then reuse uh, that reprocess spent fuel as new fuel for new reactors. And if you don't do that, then uh, the nuclear industry has always realized that they have only a finite lifetime as an industry. They can't really keep powering uh, various nations around the world, and they certainly can't expand to the degree w that would be needed for replacing oil or even a significant fraction without this plutonium reprocessing. If you doubt this uh, assertion of mine, just bear in mind that every country that has a major commitment in nuclear power has also invested in reprocessing. That includes uh, UK, France, uh, Russia, Japan, India. They all have invested in plutonium recycle and, and reprocessing. And why is that? Well, the reason why is because the nuclear waste is in the form of these irradiated fuel bundles. These are can-do fuel bundles. This gentleman is actually in a Canadian Nuclear Association ad. He's holding up a mock uh, fuel pellet, and he's standing in front of these mock fuel bundles, which if they were fresh fuel bundles, he could actually do that safely for a short period of time. But if they were used fuel bundles, he'd be dead in a matter of uh, – he'd have a lethal dose of radiation in a matter of seconds because one of those fuel bundles would kill any human being at a distance of one meter, would give a lethal dose in about 15 seconds. 15 to 20 seconds. And why is that? Why is it that the used fuel is millions of times more radioactive and billions of times more, more uh, toxic, radiotoxic, than the original fuel uh, when it's fresh? Well, let's take a look at what's in can-do nuclear fuel. When it's fresh, it's really just uranium. That's what it is, with, it, with some impurities. And in one kilogram of fresh fuel, you have 993 grams of a type of uranium called uranium-238. 
and about 7 grams of uranium-235, that's your 0.7%. And that's true all over the world, whenever you mine uranium. But if you look at the used fuel, <laughs> look, you've still got 985.8 grams of uranium-238. This means that almost 99% of the used fuel is the same as when it started. It's uranium-238. There's only, uh, you, you've really depleted the uranium-235. It's gone down from 7 grams to 2.3 grams. You have a new uh, isotope called uranium-236, and you have this new substance, this man-made element called plutonium, which is about 3.8 grams of plutonium. And uh, that's really the potential fuel of the future that the industry has always t had a, cast an eye on. Now, look at this. We only have 6.3 grams of what are called fission products. Those fission products are the are the ones that actually cause the meltdown of the reactors at uh, at Fukushima. Even though there's such a tiny tiny amount, that's less than that's only about half of a percent of the total, and yet that's what causes all of the damage. That's what drives the heat of the uh, of the reactor fuel up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,800 degrees Celsius, whereupon it melts down. Here's a look at the Fukushima reactors before they melted down and also after the earthquake. The earthquake didn't do any visible damage to the reactors. Even the tsunami did not do very much visible damage to the actual reactor buildings. But it was afterwards that these reactors started exploding and started melting down and caused enormous devastation. Um, and all of that was because of the nuclear waste. Because those reactors were shut down instantly, immediately as soon as the earthquake happened, the reactors were shut down completely. So all of this damage is done actually by the radioactive waste, and in particular by the fission products. That tiny quantity of fission products has done all this damage and continues to do damage. Uh, <laughs> I've uh, commented that this must be Rob Ford's younger brother, but uh, at any rate... Uh, I was on CTV several times talking about current problems. Uh, they have huge tanks containing contaminated water, so contaminated that it would be deadly to these workers if they uh, stayed near unprotected near some of these uh, uh, pools of water that leak out. They've got over a 1,000 of these tanks built, and they're building more every day. And the reason why is because they're still pumping 400 tons of water a day down into the melted cores and back up to the surface, and that water becomes so contaminated with fission products that it has to be stored in these tanks, and they've got over a 1,000 of them already. So um, it's very difficult for the human mind to comprehend how extraordinarily dangerous these, this tiny quantity of, of uh, highly radioactive material can be. <clears throat> so what is reprocessing? Well, and what does it do in terms of, uh, uh, they often say, the people in the industry, they say, well, wouldn't it be good to recycle this stuff? You know, we could use it as, as more energy. And uh, everybody says, wow, that's a great idea, recycling. We're all in favor of recycling. But, in fact, reprocessing or recycling does not reduce the, the amount of fission products per unit energy left over in the waste. And the radioactivity of the waste will be roughly the same for centuries afterwards. So it really doesn't change the situation. The heat generation of the spent fuel, the stuff that caused the meltdown, that's going to be the same in the residual waste that are left over, even though the volume has been greatly reduced. And the cost of geological disposal is roughly the same with or without reprocessing. Now, these, are docu these statements come from Atomic Energy of Canada Limited. These are not anti-nuclear people. This is in uh, a paper uh, which uh, was published by the International Atomic Energy Agency, written by two men from Chalk River. I'd just like to back up a second to point out to you that the only thing that reprocessing leaves over, they take away when they reprocess. What they do is they dissolve the entire bundles. They chop them up, and they put them into boiling nitric acid, and they dissolve as much as they can. And, what they're left, and, what, and then they chemically remove the residual uranium. That's the uranium-238 and the uranium-235 and the uranium-236 and the plutonium. And all they're left over with is this small quantity of fission products and other actinides. Those are other uh, transuranium elements, elements heavier than uranium. That's what we're talking about when we talk about post-reprocessing waste. The volume is greatly less, and yet the cost of geological disposal is roughly the same with or without reprocessing. 
And the reason for this is because the size of the repository doesn't depend upon the volume of the waste. It depends upon the toxicity and the heat that's generated by it, especially the heat that's generated by the waste. And that's not different after reprocessing. So now here's another article that uh, Brenane mentioned, uh, 2008. This comes from, uh, actually this comes from the NWMO. It's an NWMO back, background paper. It says reprocessing may indeed become an interesting alternative. It will not increase the burden of the, they say it will not increase the burden of the repository and therefore it should be acceptable. There's no social acceptability problem as all the high level waste is Canadian. When they say HLW, high level waste, what they mean there is the liquid solution that's caused after they have separated out the uranium and the plutonium. They are left with this highly radioactive liquid acidic solution which then has to be re-solidified. And they say this is not a problem of social acceptability because it's all Canadian. And the used fuel will have to be transported to a central site anyway, so what difference does it make, basically, is what they're saying, whether you reprocess it or don't reprocess it. I think that this shows you the really cavalier attitude towards the communities, because the communities have no idea what they're in store for if there is going to be reprocessing later on their communities are going to become among the most radioactively polluted sites on Earth. I say that with confidence because every place on Earth where there has been reprocessing is a terrible mess. Hanford, Washington is an example. Sellafield in northern England is another example. La Hague in France is another example. You can look at the Mayak plant in Russia uh, where they did. All of these areas are among the most radioactively contaminated areas on Earth. And to tell these communities that they are simply going to bring the waste in in solid form and handle them in this nicely packaged form and put it deep underground way from har out of harm's way is profoundly deceptive because the community should be informed exactly what this possibility is. I believe that unless the nuclear industry is terminated, that this is not only likely but really inevitable, and I think the industry thinks so as well. If you go back to the environmental impact study that Atomic Energy of Canada Limited did back in 1994, this is the one that was, you know, the result, uh, what was submitted to the Seaborne panel, the Seaborne panel that made its ruling on the environmental assessment, 10-year uh, environmental assessment program. They say in their document on page one that when they talk about nuclear waste, nuclear fuel waste, they're talking about either the used can-do fuel bundles or the solidified high-level waste from reprocessing. They have always been upfront about this, but only in a very, very uh, verbal way because they don't explain anything about what reprocessing entails or what the environmental or health effects might be for that. They also say on page 333, it would be desirable to select a site for centralized storage and disposal that was also suitable for a reprocessing facility. Because if you can't reprocess this stuff, then what good is it? Basically, uh, my experience has been that virtually everybody in the industry that I know of who has a, a visionary approach to nuclear power, who really sees nuclear power as having a long-term future, um, they all uh, think that it would be a crime to bury this waste without getting the plutonium out first. So uh, reprocessing is something they dearly want to do. And one of the reasons for postponing the burial for uh, centuries even is to, to get the job done, first of all, of getting it all in one centralized site so that later on they can spring this decision of reprocessing on the poor community that said, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll do our civic duty and make ourselves rich by accepting the nuclear waste. So uranium is element number 92 in the chart of elements. Uh, naturally speaking, there's only 92 elements, and they're all numbered consecutively, and that's called the atomic number. And uranium is the key element for all nuclear technology, both military and civilian. As already mentioned, uranium in nature is actually a blend of two different varieties or isotopes. Uh, one of them is called fissile uranium, and that's uranium-235, only seven atoms out of 1,000. And the other one is called the fertile isotope, uranium-238, 993 atoms out of 1,000. It's the uranium-235 that really provides the energy. So what are these fissile atoms? Well, fissile atoms can be fissioned or split, 
And in doing so, they release a great deal of energy, which can either be an atomic bomb or it can be a uh, fuel for a nuclear reactor. The important thing is that they, these fissile atoms, can sustain a nuclear chain reaction. Here's what happens with U-235. When a neutron hits, a neutron is a subatomic particle that's uh, necessary to get the, the process going and keep it going. When a neutron strikes an atom of uranium-235, sometimes it kind of bobbles like, a, like an unstable soap bubble and splits into two or three even. And these are called fission products. And these fission products are collectively millions of times more radioactive than the uranium. So every time you hear things like strontium-90, cesium-137, krypton-85, just bear in mind that they all started off as uranium atoms. They all started off uh, as uranium atoms at some point in time, and these are the broken pieces of those uranium atoms, and they're highly unstable. That's what makes them so radioactive. And, of course, we get energy, and that energy is the main point. And it's not only uranium-235. If you split any heavy atom, any heavy atom, even U-238, you will get energy. But there's one thing about U-235 that makes it special. You get more neutrons, and those more neutrons are really crucial because that means you can multiply the neutrons. Uh, just by using one neutron, you can set a chain reaction in motion, and it, you get a self-sustaining chain reaction. That doesn't happen with any other naturally occurring element except uranium-235. It's the only one. So you get the multiplication of neutrons, which is, leads to or allows the multiplication of energy. So how many fissile materials are there then? Not... People often get confused, uh, not surprisingly, because the industry doesn't explain things. Um, and they think that radioactivity is maybe the same thing as fissile. No, 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 not at all. There's lots of uh, naturally occurring radioactive materials, but only one, which is fissile, and that's uranium-235. And there's only two others that we know of, and those are the human-made ones, plutonium-239, which doesn't exist in nature, and also the other odd-numbered uh, plutonium isotopes like plutonium-241, uh, for example. And also, a substance called uranium-233 doesn't exist in nature in measurable amounts, but it comes from thorium. You've heard about thorium reactors and thorium fuels. Well, thorium is not really a fissile material, but it can be used to create a new fissile material called uranium-233. And that fissile uranium-233 is actually uh, what, what is the fuel. Only fissile atoms can be used as a nuclear explosive or as nuclear fuel. So the first two atomic bombs were actually made from the two fissile materials that were available in 1945, and that was highly enriched uranium for the Hiroshima bomb and plutonium, which had to be made in a nuclear reactor. Those are the reactors at Hanford. The first reactors that were built were built to produce plutonium, not to produce electricity. Electricity was an afterthought. All nuclear reactors produce plutonium automatically. I'll explain this a little bit uh, in a moment. Um, so <clears throat> these are the first two bombs, and they represent the two fissile materials. There have also made and exploded bombs made from uranium-233 as well, subsequently. The reason why those bombs look different is because they have different mechanisms inside. The uranium bomb is a very simple type of bomb. It's called a gun-type assembly. It's just question a question of firing one piece of uranium into the other piece of uranium. But the uranium has got to be highly enriched. It can't be just natural uranium out of the ground. And that is the obstacle. That's why everybody's upset about Iran enriching uranium. They figure that if they can enrich it a little bit, then they can enrich it a lot as well. And if they can enrich it a lot, they can make these very relatively simple atomic bombs. Now, plutonium bombs are more complicated. They, for technical reasons, they can't, be, they can't use the gun-type method. You have to use a more complicated method called an implosion assembly. But, uh, but that's not beyond uh, the capabilities of even a, a well-equipped terrorist group. Now, what is highly enriched uranium? Well, on the left in this chart, we see a symbolic representation of what can-do fuel is like. It's only one atom out of a, a seven atoms out of a thousand that are uranium-235, and that's really the fuel. Now, for light water reactors in the states, uh, they use low enriched uranium, which is usually typically from three to five percent of uranium-235. What's the rest? Well, the rest is the uranium-238, which is the non-fissile uranium. 
When you get to highly enriched uranium, it's 20% or more, and that's the stuff that can be used in uh, nuclear weapons. Those are weapons-usable forms of uranium. You can use that gun-type mechanism to make a bomb. Um, also, those are the types of uranium that have to be used when you have what are called fast reactors. A fast reactor is something that uses fast neutrons instead of slow neutrons. That's a little bit difficult to understand, but let me explain. Go back to the can-do fuel for a minute. The trouble with all those U-238 atoms is they, they get in the way of the fissioning of the, of the small number of uranium-235 atoms, and the only way that you can get a self-sustaining chain reaction with such a low percentage of U-235 is to slow the neutrons down. And if you slow the neutrons down, you increase the chances of fission, and so you can get a sustaining self reaction, uh, self-sustaining chain reaction. The stuff that slows it down is called the moderator. And in, in can-do reactors, we have to use a very expensive, very efficient moderator called heavy water. In the light water reactors in the States, they don't have to use heavy water, which is very expensive. They can use ordinary light water. And the reason why is because they have increased the percentage of uranium-235 atoms by enrichment. If you go further, though, then you can get to the case where you have actually weapons-usable material. The important thing to bear in mind here is that the present generation of reactors does not necessitate the handling of weapons-grade materials, materials which are immediately weapons-usable. That's an important point because in the future, if we start using fast reactors, you're going to have weapons-grade material being handled all the time, and that poses horrendous possibilities. Because imagine criminals and, and, and terrorists would have a relatively easy task of getting their hands on something that is being routinely traded and transported in the civilian market. So let's turn the attention now to what are the fertile atoms. The fertile atoms are atoms which are not fissile, but which can be transmuted into fissile atoms, provided they first absorb a neutron. And as far as we know, there are really two fertile elements of significance, and those are uranium-238, which I've just been talking about, and thorium-232, which people talk about nowadays as some kind of magical thing. It's not magical at all. They've talked about thorium for decades. In fact, ever since, even before the, the first atomic bombs were built, they were talking about using thorium as a, a way of artificially generating more uranium. What are they worried about? They're worried about running out of uranium. The uranium supplies are limited. And in, in particular, uranium-235 is a rare form of uranium. So uh, they're going to run out of uranium around the same time they run out of oil, and they've always known this. Now, the reason they haven't run out yet is because the nuclear renaissance has not occurred. They haven't had thousands of reactors built. They've only got about 430. Uh, if they built thousands or tens of thousands of reactors, they would really quickly have problems fueling them because there wouldn't be enough uranium-235 to go around. That's why they're investing in reprocessing. And that's why I'm quite confident that ultimately this waste repository that NWMO wants to establish will ultimately, there will be a lot of pressure on the government to allow reprocessing of that fuel to extract the plutonium. Now, the creation of plutonium in a nuclear reactor occurs when the non-fissile atom of uranium-238 absorbs a neutron, and it doesn't split, but what it does is it, well, here it is in French, so you can understand better. Uh, when the neutron hits the non-fissile uranium atom, then it doesn't split, it becomes heavier. It turns into a substance called uranium-239, and then it gives off two beta particles and turns into a new substance, plutonium-239. That's how plutonium is created. And you can understand that it's inevitable that plutonium is going to create it in all reactors that are fueled with natural uranium. They've got to be. So plutonium, this is how much plutonium was in the Nagasaki bomb. That's how much plutonium you need to destroy a city. And inside, if you look at a Kandu reactor, uh, they produce every year enough uh, uh, plutonium in their spent fuel to make several bombs, and of course, over the course of the lifetime, hundreds of bombs, and possibly even a thousand or more bombs. So these reactors are actually producing electricity as a kind of a flash in the pan, because you only get electricity for 20 or 30 or 40 years if you're lucky, whereas the plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years. 
So actually, the uh, the reactors are really the main product is the nuclear waste, which lasts, which remains dangerous for millions of years, and the plutonium, which remains available for hundreds of thousands of years after the reactor is shut down. And that's uh, really why we have a huge question about proliferation of nuclear weapons associated with all nuclear reactors. Now, uh, even even the so-called H-bomb, uh, everybody's heard, well, don't, haven't we got these mo more powerful bombs called H-bombs, which use the H stands for hydrogen. They're sometimes called the hydrogen bomb. Well, you know what? If you look at this model of the H-bomb, that's Howard Moreland holding it on the steps of the Supreme Court of the United States. You notice at the very top, there's that little black ball inside. That's plutonium. Without that plutonium, the H-bomb cannot possibly explode. When they talk about dismantling these warheads, they're talking about taking the plutonium out. Once you remove the plutonium, the bomb is not a bomb anymore. So, uh, but in order to get the plutonium, as I said before, you have to chop up the waste, you have to dissolve it in nitric acid, you get a witch's brew of liquid waste. And these tanks here at Hanford, these are new tanks that are under construction at the moment that the picture was taken. Um, these tanks contain millions of gallons of high-level radioactive liquid waste, which is the result of reprocessing solid spent fuel for the purpose of getting plutonium for bombs. And uh, you'll notice all those pipes coming out of the roof. Well, these tanks are quite complicated. They have to have their own cooling systems because the waste is radioactive and so radioactive that it, it continues to heat up. You've got to keep removing that heat constantly. Also, there's chemical reactions going on in there all the time. And there's, as a result of this, there's a sludge that forms. So this sludge is very thick and very difficult to handle. And beneath the sludge, you have gases building up, and the gases cause burping, and the burping actually rocks the tanks. So they have to have paddles inside, which actually stir the liquid to prevent it from uh, uh, deteriorating into a kind of a sludge compartment that, uh, that could jeopardize the integrity of the tanks. Even so, they've had millions of gallons of high-level radioactive liquid waste leak out of such tanks in about three states in the United States. I'm talking here about Washington State, Idaho, and South Carolina, where Savannah River is. Now, even in Canada, uh, when we first got started, now, uh, where I see we're at 1234. I'll try and uh, go quickly through the rest of these slides. Um, in Canada, uh, if you go to Chalk River, um, they did a lot of reprocessing right from day one. As a matter of fact, this plaque in Chalk River, right outside the uh, visitor center, says that the first reactor in Canada was built, was started up in September of 1945, and it was originally part of an effort to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm hearing a voice in the background. I'm not sure if that's somebody t speaking to me or... No. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, they built a reprocessing plant at Chalk River. A lot of people don't know this. And they actually did separate plutonium back in the late 40s and early 50s. And they did this for, at the behest of the British scientists who were charged with Winston Churchill for developing the British atomic bomb. And they needed plutonium, and they needed to know about plutonium. And they used uh, the Canadian reactor, the NRX reactor, to get their knowledge and even the first sample of plutonium metal they got from Chalk River. Um, so Canada had a role to play in reprocessing right from the very beginning. Another thing that's not well known by Canadians is that at Chalk River, they have actually manually fabricated over three tons of uh, plutonium-based nuclear fuel. They've done this in glove boxes, and they bring this plutonium in from various sources. So um, they have always been interested in reprocessing. And uh, if they tell you that they're not interested, they're not being frank about it. Now, here's the biggest problem of all with reprocessing, and that is that right now the, the radioactivity of the spent fuel is so enormously great that you can't get close to it without dropping over dead, uh, at least within a couple of weeks. So you could say that the radioactivity is like a firewall that separates the reactor in the foreground from the bomb in the background. You can't get the plutonium out of the spent fuel and into the bomb without breaking through this firewall. So that's what reprocessing does. 
Reprocessing is a robotic factory, often called a canyon, because it has to be gravity-fed. It's a robotic factory. It can't be run by human beings. And it separates the plutonium from the rest of the fission products. And once the plutonium is separated, it can be fairly easily handled and fairly easily transported. It's deadly dangerous once it gets inside your body. But outside your body, it's harmless because it's a, what's called an alpha emitter. And alpha radiation can't even penetrate through a piece of paper. So you could actually carry plutonium in a paper bag, although I wouldn't advise it. And uh, you would not be getting, as long as all that plutonium stayed inside that bag, you wouldn't be getting any dangerous radiation dose. It's just getting the tiniest little speck in your body that might kill you. So reprocessing, which is also used by the industry to call recycling, a very misleading term because actually you're only extracting a tiny fraction of the mess. And uh, it's not the most radioactive part at all that you're extracting. And you're reusing it as fuel. So uh, that's a strange kind of recycling. It makes a bigger mess than you started with. Um, also, that's the key to the nuclear renaissance, because you can't have a renaissance unless you start using plutonium as a fuel. So, um, uh, excuse me, I just have to do something. I'll be... So um, this question about the nuclear renaissance really presupposes uh, that reprocessing is going to become commonplace around the world. And a lot of people have commented that such a world is really impossible to safeguard because it's just so widespread, it's so widespread that you can't really prevent uh, criminal organizations or rogue states from getting their hands on this plutonium and using it to make atomic bombs. Um, I just want to say a few more things if I have time. I'll ask Bernane, uh, do you think I should stop here, Bernane, or I just wanted to give a few more points of history, but I don't have to. Yeah, no, I think you should continue, Gordon. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll just continue then for a couple of more uh, considerations here. Sorry, I had a little emergency I had to deal with. All right, here we are. Now, um, oh yeah, these are, this is a picture taken by my friend Robert Del Tredici, who took most of these black and white photographs. This is in, this is in, it's near the reprocessing plant in Russia, which is called Chelyabinsk. And these women are standing by the shores of the Techa River, which is one of the most radioactively contaminated bodies of water in the world. And the reason it's so contaminated is because Joseph Stalin wanted to get the atomic bomb before his birthday, and so he ordered the nuclear scientists to speed up the production of plutonium. And so they started dumping high-level radioactive liquid waste right into the river, the Techa River, which flows right by the town that these maids, these are called the maids of Muslimovo, and Muslimovo is one of the towns downstream. And for many years, the townspeople got very sick with very strange diseases, and the doctors were not allowed to use the word radioactivity. Instead, they called it vegetative syndrome. And they said that people were suffering from a vegetative syndrome. Well, if we go back to 1977, and this is why I personally am so convinced that the nuclear industry cannot be trusted at all on this point. Uh, in 1977, I was participating in a Royal Commission of Inquiry in Toronto called the Porter Commission. And in February 28th of 1977, Ross Campbell, chairman of AECL, hosted a, a secret seminar in Ottawa for senior civil servants. And it was an all-day seminar. And he said, we wouldn't have asked you to set aside a whole day if we didn't consider that the proposed Canadian fuel recycle program is too important to, to, to uh, postpone. The separation and use of plutonium would be a long-range job we're already late in starting. The next uh, uh, speaker was Stan Hatcher from uh, the White Shell Labs in Manitoba. He said, we've got to learn how to reprocess fuels. We've got to start this year, and we've got to get it operational by 1981. We need to start this year. We're already late. And then the next speaker said, I haven't said much about, and this guy, by the way, is the president of AECL at the time, John Foster. Um, I haven't said, he was later fired, by the way, uh, I have not said much about the waste disposal aspect. It's not because it's not important. Now get a load of this. 
Waste disposal is extremely important, but it cannot be dissociated from the fuel recycle program. In other words, in other words, when you talk about nuclear waste disposal, that's really just a kind of a a pretext almost for reprocessing. It's a part of reprocessing. You can't separate it. And as he says at the end, plutonium is an extremely useful material, and we will be dealing in it. Now, I don't take this as an idle threat. I take this as a very serious uh, promise that we're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing this. But they're saying this in private and in secrecy. And here's what got me uh, really uh, alerted, was that they had said exactly the opposite to the Royal Commission of Inquiry just, just a month or so earlier. They had said that they had no plans for reprocessing and that they were not interested in reprocessing now, although in the future it might possibly have some interest. So they were simply lying. And uh, I don't think they would lie about it unless they felt that it was so important that they had to lie about it. They felt that they could get away with it. They didn't get away with it because we blew the whistle and we presented to the commission the notes, uh, the the entire notes of of that meeting, which are also on uh, the CCNR website. So uh, the uh, the, the report that came out from the Royal Commission in 1978 called A Race Against Time said very explicitly in the major conclusions Reprocessing should not be part of Ontario Hydro's system planning. Hence, there is no need for a central interim storage facility for spent fuel. All spent fuel should be stored at the nuclear generating station sites, either in circulating storage bays or in dry storage if this proves feasible. There wasn't any dry storage at that time. We prefer on-site spent fuel storage to a centralized facility because we believe that a central facility would presuppose the reprocessing of spent fuel. It would also involve more transportation and social and environmental problems. I think that's very important because here you have people who are not – it was a, an emeritus professor of engineering, uh, Arthur Porter, who was the chairman of that commission. And after listening to three years, they had, they had years of testimony, and I had the opportunity to cross-examine nuclear experts for actually three months on a daily basis, which is pretty amazing uh, compared with the processes we have today. But um, – I think that people should take this warning very seriously because these communities, which are now being targeted by NWMO, um, they think that they're buying into something that's rel- that's safe and that is uh, going to not tarnish their environment beyond repair. However, if they end up being a site for a reprocessing plant, they're dead. I mean, as a community, the way they are now, they're certainly dead. They'd have to be totally transformed, and they would have to also be subjected to military-like um, security. It's almost like martial law. And the reason for that is because plutonium is a strategic nuclear material which can be used for nuclear weapons so that everybody in town would have to be subject to very close scrutiny. And not only those people, but all the people along the transportation route would have to be CSIS targets, uh, very specifically CSIS targets, because any one of them could be uh, open to uh, terrorist uh, they could be open to blackmail or various things that would make that would cause a security risk. So this is a very big issue and something that I think the community should know about and everybody else should know about. Now the last slide I have here is a snapshot from the wall of the Saskatoon Airport where they have this fantastic mural that covers an enormous space, all devoted to the nuclear fuel chain or cycle. Um, and it's uh, uh, celebrating and idolizing, really, Chemical Corporation. Here's one of the panels. It says, power generation harnesses the energy released when U-235 atoms split. The heat produces steam, which drives large turbines. Nuclear power generation produces no air pollution or carbon emissions. Well, how nice. They don't point out that coal burning or oil burning or natural gas burning or wind or solar doesn't produce plutonium. But uh, what they'd like to do is compare their technology with something totally inappropriate and rather than comparing it with something which really is appropriate because they're the only ones who produce plutonium so uh, or, or nuclear waste, high-level nuclear waste. So the question is, is this the end or is this really just the beginning? I believe that we have, we're really seeing the end of the nuclear power age, the age of nuclear power. I, see, I think we're seeing it winding down but we're only seeing the beginning of the age of nuclear waste. 
And as responsible citizens, we're really going to have to be on our toes and be alert and not be allow ourselves or our, our communities uh, to be sucked into what ultimately could be a disastrous deal for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Edwards. That was, uh, that was um, very helpful and uh, a lot of material 